All right, Steve, come on, man. Welcome to Data Edge. Good to have you, man. I can't believe it's taken this long. I'm here. I'm so excited to be around people who care about what the next generation looks like. Thank you for having me here, Larry. Well, can I just can I just share and express that uh, there there is a part of me having you on here that is quite selfish because I'm so keen to dig into your knowledge and into your book about how we can uh, how how number one we view this perspective of the next generation, but how we can you know communicate with them, connect with them, how we can actually you know help them blossom as they navigate life. Uh, because I think if if we really look back, if we if we look back at several generations, you know I, I think the generation who's leading, who's in front always looks at the generation in the back. I wouldn't say always, but a lot of times be like, what's wrong with these kids today? Right. It's always like, they're all broken. We had it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, that's 100% right. It's in fact, it's not sometimes it's always 100% yeah. always. Yeah. That's, that's where it is. Um, so the, you know, which buttons to push right on me. Cause that, yeah. that that's huge. We, we walk a we walk a really interesting tagline, generationally yeah. speaking. So, the beautiful thing um, with all the generations, and I mean, we can start as as early as the silent generation, baby boomers. Then we go Gen X, then we go millennials, and then we get to Gen Z, and then we get to Alpha generation. And so, um, what's 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 fascinating about all the generations? Those are the recorded generations, right? So obviously, they are more, but. Those are the generations that we started to really document well in, in kind of recorded human history, if you want to say it that way. And um, the, the, every single generation actually flips, right, on, on a number of things that happen in and around the time that they're a generation. And we never noticed that. We never recognized that so much until you sit down and really study it. And as a result of that, what we've seen from millennials and older, right, so those 30 and older, let's call it, um, for round figures that, you know, they, my, my parents said this, Larry, I guarantee your parents said this, uh, oh, Steve is just going through a phase. We're going to wait for him to snap out of it. And Gallup actually does some research on this and they, and they, they've also recognized that this is the first time in kind of what we call recorded human history that you can't actually be sitting, waiting for a generation to become like you, because it's actually not going to happen. But that's what happens. You know, we've gone through all these different generations, there's been a, a, a group of things that have come into each generation while they've been living that has has caused them to think differently, behave differently, interact differently, value different things. And then what you see is a generation flips and then the next generation comes. So it's not just a mathematical computation of 15, 20 years and then a genera generation, generation. And... Um, and so that journey has taken us to a place exactly where you where you say that, where the older generation looks down at the younger generation, then, oh, what a pity, man! What is wrong with these kids? Yeah, today? what is wrong? It's kind of like I always joke. It's kind of like Microsoft uh, Vista, uh, Windows Vista. Sorry, we all wish it never happened, but it happened. Like, what are you going to do, right? So, like, oh, this Windows yeah. Vista. Do you remember Windows Vista by any chance? I do. Right, yeah, dude. I remember Lotus Notes. Come on. Right? <laughs> so it's kind of like that. You're like, oh, this generation. But what's so cool about that is the motive is usually this. We, we, the older generation has usually experienced a lot. They usually have bumped their heads and scraped their knees. And so in part, they carry this passion to pass some of that knowledge down to, to the younger generation so that they can, you know, be called into a greater version of themselves, which is, which is great. That should be celebrated. Um, but I say the motive is not always that the motive is just sometimes like, I don't have the patience, just do it like you're supposed to do it. And why don't you get it? Right. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. We, I never <laughs> fall into that trap. Um, yeah. actually I have a question for you on that. I, I, um, you just sparked something in me that, that made me really, really curious, which is, um, so I think we're talking a lot about like, so for instance, our generation, right. And, and how we view the generation that's, bef that's after us, right. Just as our generation of our parents and grandparents probably viewed us. Yeah. But I'm, I'm so curious. I want to flip the switch just a little bit because I remember going through this myself, right. As, as a, as a younger person and somebody who was ahead of me in life and they would, they would, whether it be my parents or whether it would be, you know, an authority, an authoritative fi figure of some sort. And they would say something to me and be like, you don't know anything. Well, you don't know anything about my life. Like, well, how, well, how would you even know? And now I look at that and I'm like, oh my gosh, of course they do. Cause they've been down the road. Right. But as a kid, so I know we're talking about the view of what we have, of, you know, versus, 
you know, this generation before us, but why is it that younger generations, just like us, just like me, look at the older generations and be like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. I love that. I love that, Larry. You know, the, the, the beautiful thing is that, um, I, I, when I do presentations, I have this really cool slide and on the slide is it's Gen Z are not just going through a phase and the picture on it really, it's the mom, the dad, the, the, the daughter, and then a younger son and they're all the mom, dad and daughter all dressed the same like goths and the son is dressed like a little nerd. And so it's kind of funny. And, and, and the, the, the reason for it is just this, right? We, they're not just teenagers going through a phase so look there's something real about being a teenager and going through a phase there's something real about that not call it rebellion but that that journey that you go on trying to figure out who you are it's a part of what we call always becoming so in your teenager phase you're testing out the boundaries and trying to get a sense of like who are you and where do you fit into this world so naturally part of that is like i don't need what you've got because i'm figuring out for myself so that that's something very natural right and that's why we snap out of it because we eventually find some kind of a rhythm and we figure out where we fit into this whole world hierarchy and like you know we, we find our call it our place right so that's what always happens you know you'll find it they call it the terrible twos when kids go through this there's a part of them just trying to figure stuff out and so how it plays out is in this like uh but it's, it's just part of the natural curve just like um you know the the, the journey of learning I, I don't know if you knew this i know this might I studied education, never actually taught in the classroom. I did other kinds of teaching because I was a professional tennis coach. But my wife is also a teacher. And our son, uh, my, who's, who's the oldest of my two, um, he's completely ambidextrous, right? And at some point, there's this thing, who knew, that my wife did, called crossing the midline. So you've got this line in your body and you actually have to cross over with your left and your right to be able to do something across the midline. And if you're ambidextrous, you kind of stop here and you don't cross, right? So that's a developmental thing, just like supposedly crawling is a developmental thing, right? Those who are smarter than me know those things. But the point I'm trying to make is that this this pushing back against authority and parents in particular um, is, is a very natural part of where we're going. It doesn't mean rebellion. It, it just means I'm trying to figure out who I am in this whole world. So did that address what you, what your, yeah? I did, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, and I've never, you know, as you're, as you're sharing that, I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm like literally bringing myself back to, yeah. you know, when I'm younger and being around my friends and some, you know, adults says this or that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I am so curious though. How did you even, you know, you're, you're, you're a coach in, in uh, the corporate leader leadership space, right? Professional teams. You're doing a lot of things. I'm so curious. How did you get involved with this research with generations? Yeah, and it was quite selfish, really, right? And so um, part of a business that um, has been just really, really successful. And so the business was and is to run summer programs. But don't think of summer camp like you'd see in a movie necessarily. Nothing wrong with that. That's just not the vertical we were in. And so we would partner with universities, professional sports teams, private schools, um, and we would bring students from literally every state in America and actually 140 different countries to spend summer in the United States, right? In all these different places, doing all these different programs, anything from sport to fashion, all the way up to business and medicine. It was just this incredible amount of, you know, different options. And so when I came um, into the business, I, I was really fortunate to grow within the business and at some point became the CEO of the business. And we were tracking this journey, um, a global journey, because we would see tens of thousands of kids. In fact, tens and tens of thousands of kids. And we would have this past summer, 2,000 seasonal staff. So we had to bring in um, a process that helped us know, one, what does our customer want? Two, what are their parents, who are going to be paying me a lot of money, expect and then three, how do I ensure that being in 15, 20, whatever it is, different venues and states, what does the four seasons approach look like? And I don't mean four seasons is in four seasons, but how do we make sure that we can do for them, no matter where they are, what we really hope wish they would experience, right? Because we want to challenge them, we want to stretch them, we want to grow them. And our motives were pure in that, right? We really want them to leave us being, you know, more stretched and grown than, than when they arrived. So 
tracking this, you know, the, the business and how our marketing efforts went and even how our programming and our planning and our training looked for our staff. About 12, 15 years ago, we hit this inflection point where I'm looking at the data, I'm tracking the data, always been a bit of a nerd in that sense, right? Just love that data, um, and, and especially when it can teach you something. And we noticed this seismic shift. This is when Gen Z first started to to become data worthy because you can't track someone until you know they create data. Seven years old, they're not really creating much data. And we started to recognize that if we didn't make some shifts in how we went about doing what we're doing, even our training, our marketing, we weren't going to be in business long because we noticed a shift in that generation and what they wanted, how they wanted, what they valued. And so spent a ton of time really positioning our business and ongoingly refreshing looks at, at what's going on. And, and, and as a result, having to really, really grow our business, which led me to then spend five years in trying to document some of this in, in, in a book, which came out about a year ago. And the publisher I was working with was Steve, you've got to stop at some point. You've got to, it's got to be progress over perfection because we just keep, you know, discovering and learning. And so there's so much more to it, even in, in the last year. So that's selfishly how we got there. And in that journey, I mean, working with, with the next generation, how can you not be passionate about it? It just, they're just so innovative and so creatively smart and just create such energy around them. Um, being around the adults and the parents was like such a drain. It's like, oh no, let me be around the kids. Even though I wasn't really involved with the kids on a day-to-day -day basis, when you start to create um, programming that really stirs them and 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 brings the joy and the so so that was the journey. And you know, as as a result of that, now Gen Z, the uh, the oldest of Gen Z are like around twenty eight, even closer to thirty. Some in some cases, where it depends where you draw the lines, right? And now they're 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 the only people coming to the workforce. They're um, they're middle management, and some some of them are innovation uh, innovators and have started their own businesses. And so now, you know, I've been fortunate to travel around the world meeting people. And globally, what we're seeing is that corporations are now starting to recognize that shift in terms of their customer. Fifty two percent of the world population is under the age of thirty, right? So it's a massive segment of the 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 corporate market and so they're starting to try and understand that generation better so that they can sell their products and align their products better but also we've gone through this journey of how do you re engage retain and even recruit employees and that has been an interesting challenge through COVID and to where we are now and so they're starting to reach out and say look if you've learned something that might be valuable to us let's listen and hear and see what that looks like because maybe some of that's applicable to who we are and so it, it truly is and so that's the journey we've been on so now we're in it we're in a we're in the marketplace the corporate marketplace we're speaking to organizations um and we're speaking to professional teams and helping them just kind of glean something from what what our proof of concept showed so cool i i have a question though as far as like the generations go you have you have you've done research on the generation that's 28 and younger correct oh yeah actually okay. in all generations but that's yeah. been my focus of course yeah so um I, I i am selfishly curious as well as i know my audience is too so i i think one of the biggest roadblocks that we have some of the one of the biggest obstacles that we have and like I might sound like a crotchety old man, right? Where I'm just like, rah, 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 rah. You're just done right for the kids today. I tell you what, right? But I, I do want to address something that I've heard over and over and over again. And that is uh, what I would call conversational excellence. And I'm talking like in person, nose to nose, toes to toes, in person. And what I've noticed about this generation, as well as a lot of other people, is that there's so much digital communication through phones or through email or through DMs on Snapchat and all this other stuff that when you, when you get, you know, toe to toe, nose to nose with someone who's younger, an actual conversation, at least on my end, and I think on theirs too, it feels sometimes forced. It feels almost uncomfortable. It's almost like this is not an avenue of communication that I'm used to, it, meaning like them. I don't know if you have any research about that or any advice about that or yeah, what do you got? I'd love um, to hear it. 
Yeah, what do you got? Are you, re- are you ready for this? Buckle up. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, You know, that's so so beautiful, Larry, because that's where the conversation usually starts, right? Um, in terms of that communication thing. You said it. We This is the first generation that is digital first. And that's a big deal. When you unpack what that looks like and what that means, um, <laughs> that's significant. Um, they also, 35% of their communication is digital, which is like- wow. Really? Wow, right? But you see, when, you, when you unpack that out of context, what happens is exactly what you just said, right? Well, why don't they just know it, right? So can I can I just give you a little bit of context? I'll, I'll tell you as a, a, a quickish story, if that's okay. Please. Um, and this is an analogy that if, if this analogy lands in a way that is meaningful for you, it, it just helps, right? It, it just helps understand and give you some perspective and context, right? So every generation flips on, on a number of things. When we look at what has caused Gen Z to flip, I call it the perfect storm. And there's four components of this perfect storm. And I'm going to go through them real quick. Um, I, I, I can usually spend an hour literally on each one so that people can really understand it and unpack the data around it. But it's not necessary. It's just you know for illustration purposes right now. So there's four things that make up this perfect storm. So the first thing is technology, and we can spend all day unpacking technology, but the impact of technology and the doubling time of technology, Moore's Law, I don't know if you know what that is, but I'm going to butcher Moore's Law. Butch, uh, Moore's Law is really about the doubling time in, in a capacitor or transistor, how long it takes to be able to have double the amount of power. When you look at what that's done over a period of time, it's just mind-boggling. And then when you look back through all the generations from silent all the way through to where we are now, technology is flipping so quickly and we're now at the point where that gradual change that you wouldn't really notice even over a decade is now almost happening daily so that's the first thing technology wearable technology what we do with this thing i mean it's just it's incredible right so technology is important the second one is a little bit more abstract it's called world news so we've got technology and world news and the impact of world news um being available to us 24 7 across the globe i know anything that's going on as it happens um might not sound like it's part of a perfect storm but here's the point in the 1970s there was something uh there was research done and what they shared with us is something called mean world syndrome so mean world syndrome is a cognitive bias that was studied in the 70s and the essence of it is this when you watch violent television in the 70s, the more you watch, the more irrationally fearful you are of the world outside, right? So that's what mean world syndrome in essence is. And so when you fast forward that in terms of world news and you look at what we're accessing and processing on a daily basis, mean world syndrome has been amplified immensely, right? So the mindset is this irrational fear of the world amplified and amplified over and over and over again because if you look, news skews only two ways. News skews negative or horror or humor horror or humor that's what that's what sells right and so the horror is obviously the, in the news context what we see because the humor context you have to go and find them on reels <laughs> right and so you skew very heavily so the second thing is world news so i'm talking about how this is impacting and changing a generation technology is world news is the third one is social media two sides to that coin it's part of a, a it's part of a communication tool, but it also is impacting and changing how we behave on a daily basis, right? It's, and then the third one, uh, sorry, the fourth one is something you kind of alluded to. It's, it's leadership and or parenting, whether you're in the home or in, in, in the office. And the premise of that is that we're, you were coming through a time of, of just an epidemic of under management in the home and actually in the corporation, in the office. And so we have the, uh, you know, the, the idea of when I was your age, I had to walk to school 10 miles through the snow mindset, right? And why? With no shoes on, by the way. Yeah, no <laughs> shoes on. And now you're lucky we have a Tesla that's autonomous and it can drive you to school without me being in the car. Like, you're so lucky, right? So those four things, and I'm saying that somewhat jokingly, there's obviously much more meat to all four of those bones, right? So those four things are, are the perfect storm. So the analogy is this. Millennials and older we, for the sake of this analogy, I'm calling you blue paint. Blue paint people or blue people have always looked 
at the world and what they value through a blue lens because it's their blue paint, right? And so when it, when we talk about why does a younger generation like push back and then eventually come back like the older generation, because it just takes some time for them to see the blue world like they've every, everybody else that's older than them has seen the blue world because they all have this blue lens. So now you take this perfect storm and every generation has one. I didn't unpack them, the, all the generations, what the, their perfect storms were, but every generation has one. And this one, I've just explained to you the four things. And let's call that yellow paint. So we've got blue paint. We've got this perfect storm of yellow paint. Now you pour this yellow paint onto the world. I'm pouring it out of a can. That's my hand actions right there. And slowly but surely what happens is the world turns green, right? Because blue and yellow give you green when you blend the two colors. So here's the thing. Gen Z have only ever been green. They have never lived at a time where they have been blue. And when you see that, you start to recognize something really dramatic and really different. And here's the other thing that you've got to recognize is that the younger millennials are already green and all of us are slowly turning green. And the frightening thing is that if your business, your leadership, your leadership style at home, your parenting doesn't morph green, you will be obsolete at some time really soon. And the reason I'm telling you that is this. So did you catch that analogy first? Does that make sense to you? Okay. It does. So yeah. the green world, what we spoke about a little earlier, the green world, why do they not need to, let me say that differently. Why, your original question, why are they so poor at communication? Because in the green world, communication is 35% digital. And because every thing I need access to is on this, right? On this. I don't ever have to, look for information or knowledge from the older generation like previous generations did. I actually have access to all known knowledge on this. No generation has ever lived that, right? So you've got this generation that um, have access to all information, but they haven't yet figured out why they need the older generation. And then the older generation comes in with this, when I was your age, like that just does not build a bridge, right? That just means like, listen, boomer, no matter who or how old you are, if you're older than me, you're a boomer, get out of my face. And then so to address your point about the communication, um, I'm sorry for a, for a long, long, like string of things, but they, they all do matter. There are four muscles that this green world ha does not require us to exercise a lot. So the blue people are getting weaker and weaker in this. The green people have never exercised these muscles. Okay. So you ready for these four muscles? I'm ready. Let's hear it. The first one is problem solving. And when you look at the perfect storm and you see how the world works, there's not a lot of opportunity to problem solve because we can pivot to technology, whatever it is. The second one is actually um, perseverance. And so problem solving and perseverance. The third one, you guessed it, communication. And the fourth one is actually gratitude. And when you understand how those four muscles are weak, you start to see how it changes the way people are positioned and how they behave. So last thing I'm going to tell you on, on, on this, and then we can hear what your thoughts are, is that this generation, meaning the next generation, Gen Z and Alpha generation, Gen Z have spent 40% less time in person with friends millennials that's all they did and so they were really good at relationship gen z 40 percent less time in person with friends so they just don't have a lot of opportunity to practice to communicate and those four muscles that i told you are critical in us future proofing ourselves our businesses and our children for tomorrow why because there's some data that says that the kids that are currently in sixth grade 65% of them will work in jobs that don't yet exist. So how do we prepare our own businesses? How do we prepare our own kids for that? If we recognize that in by the time they graduate, there will be 65% of the jobs out there. We don't even know what those are yet. The way that you prepare them for that is you recognize problem solving, perseverance, communication, and gratitude. We use a thing called an invisible curriculum, and we start to really teach our kids and actually, I teach leaders this as well. We use it in corporate, not just for, for kids, but you start to develop those muscles. And that is the only way really to truly prepare people for a future that is really 
unknown today. So to answer your question, yes, they're really poor at communication. There's reasons why. And those people that care and those people that matter are figuring out ways to help them grow those muscles, usually in an invisible curriculum, because those are there's a reason for that. Does that make sense? It does. It, it's funny. Like I, it, it makes so much sense, but it didn't before you explained it all. Like it, it just, right. I mean, it just it literally awesome. felt like this big ball of confusion of like, well, why is it this? And why is that? But th some of these stats, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I, I can see it, you know, 40% less time with friends. I, I was talking to my 10 year old last night and, uh, we, I was putting him to bed and, and, uh, we, we, we were chatting about, um, about basically connection. Right. And, and that kind of thing. And I, I've been using a product that we've partnered with for quite some time now, uh, called the RO and it's uh, RO is ARO, which I I'm pretty sure RO is Greek for connect. If I'm not mistaken, I might be, I might be butchering that. But anyway, um, what I've been doing is for no less than three hours every day, my goal is to log no less than 21 hours per week, no phone whatsoever. It's actually out of my it's not my pocket. It's not on the counter. It's literally in this box called the RO and the RO actually measures my time away from the phone. So my, my son and I were talking about this last night and he was telling me that, um, he's really like enjoying our talks lately and he's enjoying this and enjoying that. And, and he made a mention, he's like, I haven't seen you with your phone a whole lot. And I was like, yeah, I'm actually really, uh, I, I, I have a goal of 21 hours a week minimum that I don't have my phone. I was like, last week I hit over 30. So that was pretty good. And uh, so then we got in this conversation around phones. I was like, you know, Lawson, I was like, when I was, just, here, here I go, right? Here, I was like, when I was your age, I used to actually, you had to be home for someone to actually contact you. Like you actually, your phone was on the wall and you had to be home. He's like, well, how did you call somebody if you were out? I was like, you had to go to a pay phone. Like, or if you had like a friend whose parents were like crazy uber rich, they might have had a phone in a bag or hooked up to their car in some way, shape, or form. But that was like the one of the one of the one percenters. Not many yeah. people had those things, right? Yeah. And uh, I said, you know, it's, it's really fascinating to me because, you know, your generation, a lot of how you guys communicate is through devices. And I was like, and it's really getting back to like having face-to-face -face conversations and connections with friends and, you know, calling up a friend and say, hey, let's go play soccer you know, let's not do roadblocks. Let's not do Fortnite. you know, with our headsets on. Let's, let's actually get physically in person. And you could tell he was putting those pieces together. And he's like, yeah, he's like, because he's in fourth grade. And do you, would you believe me if I, well, actually you would, because you've done way more research than me. I would say about 75% of the students in his class have phones. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I would never give a fourth grader a phone. He's like, when can I have a phone? I was like, Minimum age, minimum is 14. And that's with a lot of boundaries around it, right? Uh, but it's it's just fascinating. And I, I am curious before we move on, because I want to I wanna talk a little bit more about how we can raise this next generation, how we can be better leaders for them, even though, quite frankly, when it comes to tech and some of these other things, I think a lot of parents feel pretty far behind. And we don't know what that bridge looks like. You use yeah. the term bridge, which, by the way, I love. What was What was the perfect storm for for like my generation, like the people who are in their 40s? Well, uh, let me take you through them real, real quick, okay? Yeah. Um, and the perfect storm, I'm just giving you an, an, a, a glimpse, n not entirely, right? So when you look at the silent generation, they never had a phone and or, uh, uh, sorry, they never had a, yeah, a, a phone or a radio. So they get the phone and the radio and all of a sudden their lives are different. Isn't that interesting, right? Mm -hmm. For the boomers, one of the great example is um, the Hoover Dam. In that area of the world, they never had electricity. Now they have. Everything is different. Then you go to Gen X. Um, they had, they didn't have a PC, and then the PC gets introduced. And all of a sudden, the home computer changes so much. We look at millennials. The internet changed the way they live life. We look at Gen Z, the smartphone, and then we look at alpha generation, and that alpha is artificial intelligence. Every one of those things, not only those things, but every one of those things dramatically impacted what they valued, how they engaged with, uh, engaged with one another, connected, how they lived life actually on a daily basis was interrupted, disrupted by that. And as a result, over a period of time, changes their behavior. 
That makes sense. So I remember even um, from a tech perspective, like I remember when Nintendo came out. Yeah. And we would all get together with our friends. And like, one, of, I mean, you, there were no headsets, no internet or anything like that. But like, in, I remember being, I think, gosh, how old was I? I think I was maybe in like, I think I was 12 when it came out. And I remember that was the first time in my childhood that we sort of, st- I don't want to say stopped because we didn't stop, but um, we really slowed down going outside. Like, cause I remember like growing up, man, we, we played so much wiffle ball. Yeah. We played football, we played soccer, we played street hockey, all these other things. Everything we did was outside. And it, even if it was cold, we were doing stuff outside. Yeah. And well, our parents also were like, go outside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But as soon as Nintendo's came into the, into the house, that's when like whoever had the Nintendo or like the new next game, you were over at that guy's house yeah. along with like seven of us, right? We yeah. just want to play and hang out. But yeah, it's fascinating. I appreciate the explanation. I'm, I'm curious as far as like parents, right? The millennials who are raising kids, people in their forties who are raising kids and parents right now, man, we're, we're really, I think just scratching our heads. And, and I think a lot of us, it's not just the kids that are kind of trapped in this tech. And I'd be actually really curious to know, like, how much of our communication, even as adults, is digital, right? Yeah. And um, you mentioned the word bridge, and that is what I'm so curious about. Like, what is, it, what is the best way for a parent to bridge that connection mm. with their kids, with everything we have going on these days? So I'm going to backtrack a little because there are a couple of things that I think are really compelling in terms of what you've touched on. I want you to know that um, growing up, the when the tech arrived at your house, your friend's house, and you guys started to go there, the it's the reason it's a perfect storm is it's the combination of a number of things that lead to a seismic shift. It's not just a thing, never, right? And so you take as an example some of the tech becoming more compelling to keep you at home and plugging you in. You take mean will syndrome, mom no longer letting you walk from your house to your friend's house. Now they have to drive you. Da, 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 da. And then you look at the safety as soon as my kid is 10, 12. Now I'm going to give you a phone so that if you get stuck, you can text me or call me because we wouldn't want you to be, you know, walking home and unsafe. And so, you know, you look at that escalation and you get to a place now where this started with millennials as a toy. That's why we call them or they are called the selfie generation because they were always taking selfies, right? Why? Because this was a toy. Now it's a tool. So when you talk about Lawson, when is he going to get a phone, there are a number of things as a parent you have to navigate. First of all, you have to navigate what is the cost of my son, my daughter being the only one without that technology in their school. Okay. And you know how brutal school can be and kids can be, right? Okay. So Uh the reason we say it's terrible is because, oh, right, we don't want to parent them, right? So this is not a technology issue. It's a parenting issue. Right. So we're now in a place where this technology is a tool. We use it. It is a part of the fiber of who we are and it's not going to change. So what we have to do as parents is we've got to recognize what this is. And if if and when you do give your child access to that, you've got to understand that navigating that and stewarding that well is your job as a parent to teach, not with a stick. Not with a stick because that never works, right? That causes just causes rebellion. But there is a real risk um, that if you aren't really together and switched on as parents of your child being the only one not for them to start to rebel in ways you can't imagine because that peer pressure when you're between the age of 10 and 16, 18 is brutal. I mean, some of us never outgrow that peer pressure, right? So, um, So, yeah, there's that. The, um, did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you look at, um, I, I, I spoke about this like maybe 10 years ago, and this was a prophetic proclamation. There will be a time where we pay to unplug, not to plug in. Cause you know, we were all trying to get faster dial up speed. And like right now my connection and ho at home, I mean, my home office is blazing fast and that's costing me money. There'll be a time where that will all be free. And if you want to unplug all that, it's going to cost you money. Right. So so that's the direction, obviously, we're heading in, and that's obvious on a bunch of reasons. But to answer your question um, more specifically about parenting and, and, and how do we do this in a meaningful way, you know, the when your perspective changes on why the generation behaves like they do, when you start to see the cause of 
the life they're living and why that's the way they, they behave. When you actually take the time to look around, you notice more and more and more adults are behaving in that way. You start to recognize this is not just about the kids, right? So uh, I'm paraphrasing your question, but is how do you become a meaningful parent in that space? Kind of what I, I felt like you were saying. And um, there are two components that that I would add to once you see things a little bit differently, um, and that's something called narrative and something called upskill. And so I'll give you an example um, from a parenting perspective. The home is the single most boring place in the world for a child to be, completely. And the reason for it is real simple. The home is the only place where you're required to put your shoes away, tidy your room, brush your teeth, do your homework, tidy up the dishes, walk the dog, right? And then when you take a moment away from that, guess what mom and dad are doing? They're sitting watching TV and or on their phones, okay? So you go to school, there could be something really cool, like a kid falling down the steps. How hysterical was that? There could be kids with phones watching YouTube videos together. There can be the teacher that you make fun of and you're just engaging with some people, right? So even school, which a lot of people don't love, is more engaging and exciting than typically the home. So the first thing parents have to understand is um, if you don't become the most compelling content in your own child's life, why should they be paying attention to you? I'm not on a I'm not on a soapbox here. It's the world we live in. We already told you the green world is based on either horror or humor, and it's based primarily on humor for the kids in this instance, right? So when you look at, well, what is going on at home today that is in some way engaging, fun, and or interesting to make them want to be there after the age of about 10, it's a complicated conversation. And where does it begin? This is where it begins. There's something called an eight-second attention span. I don't know if you've heard about that. It's wrong, by the way. Ernest and Young wrote a paper, Deloitte wrote a paper on it, and, and I told them that they're wrong, but they haven't responded to me yet. So I don't know if they ever will. But um, so, so where does it come from? It comes from this. Millennials, they said, had a 12-second attention span that's been well documented. Goldfish had a three-second attention span, five-second attention span, and now goldfish have a nine-second attention span. Why? I think it's got to do with hydrogenated water, which I've just started drinking and apparently is awesome. Okay, so that's a joke. The serious part about it is they now say that Gen Z have an eight second attention span. So what I want to want to push back on there, but it's setting up a point is this where they are wrong is it's not an attention span. It's a filter. And every one of us is green in this respect. We're green because there is so much content we have to process on a daily basis. It's impossible. So what we start to do is filter. Larry follows me on Instagram. I follow, follow Larry on Instagram. Therefore, I have let Larry into my filter. I've let him through my filter. Now, how does Larry stay through my filter? Steve is not in my filter because he's not cool. Larry's cool. He's in, right? That's the purpose of a filter, to get rid of the junk and let the good stuff through. I'm junk. You're good stuff, right? So we all filter. Now, we filter in different ways. Mom and dad, teacher, boss have a little bit more access. But what makes it compelling is this. Once you through someone's filter, you're in what we call the curated stream, which means now when you deliver content, I will take time to look at that because I'm curating and I have, now I've de declared interest. You will stay through my filter and in my curated stream as long as your content is compelling to me, right? Because when it's not compelling to me, you're out. Okay, so once you're through the filter, curated stream, you have access to... Uh, the economy that we live in today, which is an economy of permission. We're in a permission-based economy. If you recognize that if you get permission to speak into your own child's life, the way you lead them and the outcome, the fruit that comes out of that, will outshine anything else you do as opposed to because I said so and with a big stick. So that's the point of that conversation, right? That whole journey I took you on. So what does that look like? I'll give you a couple of examples. I'm going to start with this example. Are, you, are we good? Oh, yeah, we're good. Totally good. I, 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 go, to, I go to this hotel. Um, it happens to be in, in Brazil. 
And um, the first time I'm there, I uh, there's these little candies that they have called Brigaderos. It's this ball of condensed milk heaven created by the gods. It's just like delicious. Okay. <laughs> It is absolutely. So I'm coming home from a meeting and I have a bag of these. It's like designer chocolates. It's like this beautiful. I hold it like this because I'm trying to show you how precious this bag was. Okay. And I walk in and the, and the concierge says to me, hey, how was your day? Can I recommend a restaurant for you? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Because tomorrow morning early, I'm leaving for Argentina from Brazil. But and I have these brigaderos and I'm going to eat them for dinner. There's six of them. And we laugh because <laughs> it's like, who eats like a like a. So and it I, must and, be good. And and I'm like, I only have carry-on luggage. I can't take this with me and they'll be destroyed. And I actually did eat them for dinner. It was delicious. Okay. So seven months later, I'm back there. And you know what happens? I walk into my hotel room and in my room is a tray of Brigaderos with a note from the chef. Mr. Robertson, we know how much you love Brigaderos. We've been waiting for you to come back. Enjoy these. Thank you for spending time with us. My heart blown. I've got tears in my eyes. Oh, oh my God. Come wife. on. Colleen, you won't believe what happened. Look at they gave me Brigaderos in my room. You know what I didn't tell her? That there was what? a king size bed in my room. Why? Because that was an expectation. So when you get home and you're trying to parent your kids, there's certain things that are an expectation. I'm expecting mom to be kind, dad to be the, to cook me a meal, to pay, give me a like, right, there's an expectation. The only way you truly move the needle in terms of influencing your own child well is when you exceed an expectation and you go to a place that they don't expect. So I'll give you two or so examples with parents. Uh, I've, I've got many. Um, friend of mine, Steve, how do we, how do I connect with my son? His son's your son's age. Uh, Lawson is 10. Is that what you said? Yeah, okay. he's 10. So he's Lawson's age. And... Because I know my friend, I know what goes on in their life. So I'm like, they have an incredible basement in their house, big. And um, I'm like, next time your your son and his friends are there at your place playing um, Nerf Gun Wars, right? I want you to do something different. Instead of closing the door, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take your phone and I need you to go downstairs and I need you to crawl all around the floor. And I need you to video this war in action. Okay. He's like, no problem. When he does this, you know, what's amazing. First of all, the war got to a scale it's never got to before because it was being formed. Right. Secondly, when they finish the war, they go upstairs and they sit down at the computer and they download the video and then they edit the video. Upskill. They're all learning a skill they hadn't had before that. Even the dad was learning how to edit the video on the fly. Third thing, they upload the video to the World Wide Web. Everybody that is a parent and a friend watches that, that video. It's amazing. How do you connect with your, your kid? Guess whose house those kids want to come to all the oh, time. Yeah. And guess, I want to go over there. And guess whose dad <laughs> is a hero? Yeah. Their dad. Now, it's not always about this big hero thing. Another friend of mine... I happen to be running with what they do in their life is over Christmas, they, um, they take, the, they've got a son and a daughter, young kids, and they take them to a soup kitchen to serve. I'm like, that is amazing. That is amazing. But guess what happens when it's the third and the fourth and the fifth um, Christmas? That's now an expectation. That's what we do. So I said, would you like to strengthen those, in, those, those four muscles? And of course, my friend knows what I'm talking about. He's like, Yes. How can we strengthen those muscles? And I'm like, well, imagine if you did this. You take two envelopes and you put the money for each kid's dinner in the envelope. You write their names on, you hide it in the house. And a week before dinner, you tell them, guys, we're going to go out for dinner, which this is the restaurant after we've been at the soup kitchen. You have to find your money. Otherwise, you won't have money to pay for your dinner. Oh, man, do they tear that house apart looking for that money? Well, imagine the scenarios. Brother finds brothers. Sister doesn't. Brother finds sisters. Sister finds hers. Brother doesn't. They find each other's. Neither of them find it. They arrive at the restaurant, and now what do you do? Well, turns out sister finds hers, and now she's sitting at the restaurant, and she shares her money to buy a meal for her and her brother to share. Come on. Mom and dad, 
They flush. They got cash. They can eat, right? But here's the thing. Walking into that restaurant, everybody who would stand still for one second, the kids were saying, can you believe it? We have to share our dinner. And they tell the story, right? Grandpa, granny, anybody who will stand still hears the story. And it's the story of horror and victory all at the same time. We had to share our dinner. Three weeks afterwards, they find the other envelope and they share the money. Okay, here's what's compelling about that story. They create a narrative, and this is what I was telling you. There's a thing called upskill and there's a thing called narrative. When you upskill someone, which is not the king size bed, it's something different or extra, not the expectation. That upskill always, always creates a narrative, a story that validates what actually happened. So in the corporate space, the stories that bubble up in your business validate your culture. Is that really your culture? Is it aspirational or do you live it? These stories start to change the narrative of who mom and dad are in my life. It's not mm. just those people who are there. It's those people who are always looking for an opportunity in the invisible curriculum to grow muscles in perseverance, communication, gratitude, and problem solving. It doesn't help to sit at the table and say, today we are going to problem solve. Here's a stick. Go and hunt for your food. That just doesn't work. So you've got to create a way that you can strengthen those muscles little bit by little bit in a way that generates this narrative, this little story, because that story will be retold over and over and over again. This until they are 20, 30, and they will tell their kids the same story. Now, it doesn't have to be this massive thing. It just has to be something that is deliberate and authentic. And if you go about doing that, you don't have the pressure of this. Because if your content is compelling, you will never outcompete this. And locking it in a box, I, I celebrate that you're doing that. But I'm telling you that as you think about upskill and narrative, there are times that you can pull this out of the box. And it's part of the journey. It's not be, it, it's not going to be an, uh, an obstacle to overcome. I'll take, I'll, can I tell you one more story? Please. Really? Okay. You, you got me on the edge of my seat for the past like 40 minutes here. Like I've just like, I can't get enough, man. So, so, so the, the idea is this, right? Create an environment where we are going to be able to create a narrative that is meaningful, right? A friend of mine has a restaurant. It's a pizza restaurant. He can't retain servers in the restaurant. And I'm like, okay, are you ready to do something? Of course I am, Steve. Why do you think we're talking? Okay. I'm like, okay, here we go. I'm a huge sports fan, every sport you can imagine. I'm a huge soccer fan. Liverpool is my team. By the way, last night we won a trophy. It was amazing. I came back from Washington State. I was wrecked. I hadn't slept. Got to watch the match. Come on, Liverpool. And so the idea of a yellow card, you know how the referee works out a yellow card? Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you know they're introducing a blue card now? It's like a no. sin bin that they can, they can kick you out of the game for 10 minutes and bring you back. Interesting. But anyway, so I say to the first thing is, here you're going to do what you're going to do is you're going to create a yellow card, pull out this yellow card, right? You have one of them in your restaurant and it doesn't come out of your, uh, your arrow, arrow, a R O. How do you say arrow? Yeah. Arrow. Yep. It doesn't mm -hmm. come out of the arrow box every day. Pretend this is your phone, right? It's the yellow card. So today Larry arrives as a server and I'm like, Larry, you know what? I'm giving you the yellow card. Today. No, no, Steve, seriously, I get the yellow card. Thank you. Larry gets the yellow card, goes to the table. There's a whole family pizza, right? Whole two families at this table. What's your order, please? What's your order, please? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. I got your orders. As you turn around to walk away, oh, hey, can I tell you something? Sure. Do you want to know what I got? I have a yellow card. What's a yellow card? Like, you don't know what a yellow card is? No, what's the yellow card? You gotta look around because I'm the only one who has this yellow card. Tell us, what is the yellow card? The yellow card allows me to take you kids back into the kitchen to make pizza. Would you like to do that? Yes, we wanna make pizza. Okay, go back into the kitchen and you know what? We have planned for kids to come into the kitchen that night. And so there's a whole table, right? Everything ready to make pizza. As we walk in away, 
server turns around to mom and dad. Would one of you like to come and video this? Can we? Yes, come on. So now they video this and then we have pizza. You know what happened that night? That was the nicest pizza anybody ever ate in their life. Nobody had ever tasted such good pizza. Why? Because the kids made it. If it was disgusting, which it wouldn't have been, everybody is lying through their teeth. This is the best pizza I've ever eaten. Right? Secondly, that video went everywhere to everybody they'd ever, 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 ever met. Right? Thirdly, what was the problem we were trying to solve? Servers. That server gets the biggest tip they've ever got that night. And why did that server get the yellow card? That server gets the yellow card because as I'm going to give it to you, it's like, Larry, I see how meaningful and committed you are, or how meaningfully committed you are to giving people an experience when they're with us that means something. It's more than just about the pizza. I want you to have the yellow card today. Awesome. Thank you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's that just deliberate pursuit around something to make an experience even just for a moment, because we retell experiences, we don't retell king-size beds. Do you know when we talk about the king-size bed? When it was horrible and I couldn't sleep on it. Horror or humor? The horror, come on, AI is agreeing with me right there. I know, right? Look at that. <laughs> the horror, we will tell everybody the second it happens. The humor you have to create, otherwise it's at the sake of somebody else, Right. He fell down the stairs, look, here's a video. That's it, right. Mm -hmm. Or you have to create those moments. And I can just tell you, uh, last story, I promise. Can I? Please. Okay. A friend, really close friend, his son is on a journey to be straight edge. Do you know what that is? No. Straight edge, uh, the broad definition, just to keep his life clean from sex, drugs, rock and roll, all okay. of that, you know, for, for as long as he can. So his son at the age of 15 decides he's going to do that. My friend is a successful businessman. And so he goes into an agreement at the age of 15 with his son that what he will do is he will give him $20,000 if he can make it through those five years and stay off social media and stay straight edge because his dad and mom value that, right? They think that is, that is to be celebrated as do I. And so we're in three years at the age of 18. I'm, 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 I'm connecting with my friend and I'm like, so how's that journey going? And he's like, ah, I don't know if we're going to make it, Steve. Why? Because five years is a long time to dangle a carrot in front of anybody, right? If you tell me, Steve, exercise for five years and you'll look like Arnold, look at these muscles. I have a gym right here in my house, right? The, 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 I haven't been there. Can you tell? Okay. <laughs> I, I actually, I know where it is. I actually know people who have exercised. I actually know people who have muscles. That hasn't been enough to get me there, right? So... The point I'm making is five years is a long time to to ask a, ch a young man. So I'm like, hey, do you think that we could use this as an opportunity to, one, help him do what he says he was going to do? Do you know what the neurochemicals, the neuro, the brain science around you actually doing what you say you're going to do, even after five years? That would be a major win for him. So I'm like... Would you be interested in helping your son do that? And he's like, of course, Steve. And I'm like, along the journey, would you like the opportunity to strengthen some muscles in him? And by the way, the invisible curriculum that I mentioned, in every one of these cases, the parents think that they're, the bosses think, the leaders think they're doing it for their kids and for their employees. They end up benefiting from it immensely themselves, right? That's called the invisible curriculum. Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off, learning karate without knowing it. That's the invisible curriculum. So I'm like, okay, so let's do this. How about, would you gamble investing that $20,000 today? He's like, okay, tell me more. And I'm like, I happen to know he doesn't like this. I happen to like this. I'm like, should we talk about cryptocurrency? Steve, you know, I don't like crypto. I'm like, and he knows I do, right? I'm into crypto. And so I'm like, well, neither does your son. So imagine if you found something that's called mutual uncommon ground. What's, what's important about mutual uncommon ground? Well, dad's not an expert. I'm not an expert. How about we discover something together? Oh, so guess what happens? He calls his son. He says, listen, here's what I want to do. I want to play around with this opportunity to take this money and let's invest it. But there's a good chance that if we invest it well, by the time you get to 20, which is only two years away now, that money might be far more valuable than it was at $20,000. And he's like, yes, tell me more. 
well, we're going to do crypto. Guess what happened? Every mealtime, dad, I yeah. read about this. Son, I read about this. Ooh, and they end up finding this mutual uncommon ground that draws them together in a communication around a goal that both of them are actually trying to achieve. Come on, right? Does it matter at the end of the day if he wins or loses that money? No. Well, of course it's money. It matters, right? It matters. But if you had to say, I will pay $20,000 to get to the age of 20 and have such a tight relationship with my son that it matters, I would pay more than $20,000. Even if I had to work 10 shifts at Domino's Pizzas to get that money, you tell me what that costs and I would pay to get that because there is nothing more valuable than that kind of a connection with your child, right? So I'll stop there for a moment. Dude, this is this is a podcast episode that literally I'm I'm on the edge of my seat just wanting more and more and more and more. Come on. This is absolutely brilliant. Um you, you've given us so much on this. I, I'd like to go in one more direction with you. Happy to. You've talked about the connection with kids, which by the way, this is this podcast interview right here is definitely within the top for me, for me selfishly. It's really given me tremendous value. I know it's given the audience tremendous value. What about marriage? What about that connection? You've been married for 32 years. You don't get there by accident. Correct. Correct. Whew. Um, we live in a world, the green world. And because of time, I'm not going to unpack a lot, but I'm going to unpack this with you. One of the things that's that is a mark of the green world is we live in a time where we live in a time of access over ownership. So what did access over ownership look like? This is what it looks like. We've lived, the blue people have lived in a time where we've owned things. We've owned LPs, CDs, DVDs, you name it. And right now I have access to every song ever sung for 20 something dollars a month, but I don't own one. I'm in Paris watching wanting to watch my team liverpool play a soccer game i can't find it on any, on any feeds i don't speak french i turn on paramount plus i watch the game and i turn it off so access over ownership is a massive thing what is it really talking about today we live in a world where subscription is the way we live so when it comes to Music, when it comes to TV, when it comes to food, when it comes to driving, when I want it, I turn it on. When I don't want it, I turn it off. When an athlete, thank you, AI, agreeing with me, and that's a big deal. You see, I can convince AI that this is truth. Um, when I when I want to work for this company and when, when I want to work for this company, I'm now the CEO here, now I'm the CEO, I'm the coach here, now I'm the coach there. I'm the athlete in this team, now I'm the athlete in this team. So we live in a time where we live in a subscri subscription-based world. And green people have never lived in a time where it's not subscription-based, which is why it is so important for us to continually win our children over, not beat them, because we have to keep value in that subscription so that they don't turn it off. It sounds brutal. Well, that's the world we live in. We just aren't recognizing it like that. So when it comes to marriage... Um, I said a little while ago, just before our last anniversary, I said to my wife, Colleen, um, and just going on record, I do not recommend you do this. Please do not try this at home. Okay. I said to my wife, darling, our anniversary is coming up real soon. And you know what that means? That means your subscription is due. And I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to renew our subscription or not. It just depends a little bit on like how well you pull this anniversary night together, right? I'm saying that joke, I actually did, but it, I'm saying it jokingly. The point is this, we're in a relationship, now we're not. It's just like a light switch. That is access over ownership. That is subscription over ownership. We no longer own anything, which means to keep it or to keep the subscription going, it must be of value. And so in terms of marriage, when you prioritize your personal, call it connecting self in a in whatever way you are grounded as a human, right? That's this is, this is a priority order. That is the most important that you are grounded as a human, and and that often means in in a form of meditation. You got to be 
grounded as a human, whatever that looks like for you, right? The second thing is that the second most important thing is your wife. And the third most important thing is your kids. Everything else comes after that. And, and there's a principle. And the principle is this. When you prioritize and commit to those things in that order, the time that you allocate to those things will be given to you back as what I call a tithe. So you commit the time to that. And because you commit the time to that, you end up having excess abundance and favor in time in another area. Partly because your heart, your head, your all of that is so in line that it frees you up to and when you're in the out, out of that time to be really productive, engaged and meaningful. And so what does that look like in terms of marriage? It looks like this. So I'm coaching a couple of people and we just came, came through Valentine's Day the other day. And I'm speaking to, to one person that I'm, I'm working with, um, working to hit with him actually and with, with his business. And um, hey, Valentine's Day, what are you going to do? And he says to me, me and my wife are foodies. I know that. We always go out for dinner. Okay, so because I'm coaching him, I'm, I'm allowed to speak openly into his life. And I'm like, so you mean you have a king size bed? Do you make that connection? Like, oh, so you always do that? So guess what? That is actually an expectation. There's nothing exciting about that. Okay. What's the problem with an expectation is if it's not there, people are like, well, where's my dinner? Well, that isn't the purpose of the dinner. It's supposed to renew something special amongst you as, as, as a husband and a wife, right? So he's like, oh, okay, well, what should we do? And I'm like, oh, if you're open to something, I'll give you one suggestion. Each of you take $80. You allocate a different thrift shop to go to. And you go to a thrift shop. And here's the rule. You allowed your own underwear and your own shoes. I love okay? it. Okay. And you've got to buy something for dinner. Well, of course, he he's, like, he's a friend of mine. So he's a bit crazy like me, right? So he buys this wig. That cost him way more than he could afford on the budget. So he arrives at this dinner with, with this kind of jacket, no shirt, this wig. They end up having a dinner. Well, they've spoken about it a lot. It was, it was memorable. The point I'm trying to get to is that even though I'm not perfect in my marriage, because I don't cook, I'm like horrendous. I, I, like It's difficult for me to get cereal to work. I know you're just supposed to add milk to that, right? And I, yeah, it's like, I don't know about that, right? Go and sit at the kitchen table while your wife is cooking. Clean up after her, around her. And if you cook, even better, right? And be in conversation instead of being on your phone or doing something else. It's, it's about being authentic and meaningful in everything that you do. If you're meaningful with your kids, meaningful with your wife, meaningful with your th friends, meaningful with your employees, one at a time, just the one who's in front of you, I guarantee you, your life will never, ever look the same. You'll become more authentic than you've ever been. You'll start to recognize opportunities to just breathe joy, fun, excitement. And it doesn't always have to be clowning, right? It can just be something simple. I'm, I'm, I'm running with this guy who's into haikus. He's part of our haiku foundation. I'm like, haiku. So this year, I wrote a haiku for my wife. I'd never, like, done that. Like, like that's not who... Why? Because now that's something I've been exposed to. I'm like, oh, wouldn't that be cool? My point is this. Marriage takes work, takes effort. It doesn't mean it has to be hard. I'm only responsible for one thing. I'm only responsible to steward my wife. I'm not responsible and I'm not, I, I don't deserve, let me think of how I want to say that. I, I, there is nothing that she has to give me. The only job I have as a husband is to manage, steward her well, right? If that means something comes back, great. But my heart should be positioned to like the time that I'm on this earth with her, how can I make sure that I come around and alongside her in a way that just makes her the best she can be, regardless of whether she ever says thank you or ever, there's ever anything in it for me, right? And that mindset, which I haven't had my whole journey, when I, when I started to see that and walk in that, it just changed everything. And so... I work hard at trying to delight and surprise her in funny ways. And it can just be something so simple, like actually cleaning the dishes or like whatever, right? I don't want it. We often want to run a marathon and then we look at the marathon and we get overwhelmed. We often want to say, well, how do I make my marriage absolutely amazing? And it's like, oh, well, I've got to stop doing all these things and she's got to do all these things. And I don't have time. That's the kids. Just do one thing. Do one thing today. 
and do one thing next week. And then the next week, do two things if you can. And the next week, do one thing. And all of a sudden, you'll look back and you'll see everything is different. But you know what's the most important thing about this? Your kids will see the change in atmosphere in your house and will transform them just by being in your house. Gosh, this is awesome, man. <clears throat> this is awesome. You want to hear something really interesting Please. about about the unexpected thing? So, you know, um, <clears throat> this is going to sound self-serving and I don't mean it to at all, but it's, it's a reflection and it's something that, that kind of hit me in the heart as you were talking. So, um, my wife and I have really asked ourselves a question here because we, we also, we have four boys. So we have a 17 year old, 16 year old, 10 year old, and eight year old. It's, and what, what, I, what I'll tell you, Steven, they're, they're always here, always here. Y yesterday, I spent, uh, my, my oldest was out and about, he, he, he had the day planned with friends, but my 16 year old, 10 year old and eight year old, uh, my 16 year old was like, what are we doing today? I was like, you know, I was like, I, th I think we're going to go to the dog park. We're going to take the dog there. I was like, we're going to throw the football around. I was like, you know, you're Lawson, it's a little brother. I was like, I was like, dude, I was like, he's the center. I was like, you're the center for, for your varsity team. I was like, I was like, I know he would love to take a little bit of lessons from big bro. Right. And he's like, Oh, I'm on it. I got it. And we literally, and then we, we did that. We went out to lunch and then we, um, we, we just, we, we had a blast all day. And my wife and I have been asking ourselves, like, why do these kids always, especially boys, like, why do they always want to be around us? Like, what do, and, and I really put the pieces together. Yes, they have chores here. Yes, they have responsibilities and all that, but we you know, our, one of our core values under this home is the environment that we create and the deep human connections that we have with each other. And we, we do different things, man. Like, like at, at dinner time, sometimes we'll get one of those huge post-its, you know, huge ones. And then everyone gets a little post-it and every, we create little boxes with each person's name and you have to identify, appreciate and acknowledge something that someone else did throughout the week. Right. And then you take that, write it down, you post it at the person's name. Uh, the other thing too, you mentioned the thrift shop, my 16 year old and I, and then my wife and my 16 year old's girlfriend, we're going to go to Goodwill and we are actually going to go out on a double date. Before we go on the double date, we're going to, I'm going to pick out the, the outfit for my wife. She's going to pick out the outfit for me. The 16 year old and his girlfriend, they're going to do the same thing. We're going to dress up with the most ridiculous things ever and go out to dinner and they can't wait. Like they're so excited. We're doing this in two weeks. And as you said that, I'm like, why do these kids, and we do stuff like that. It's like little minuscule, tiny things that we do like that a lot. And maybe that's the reason, you know, maybe that's the reason that we, we just do these tiny little connective things that I guess really move the needle. And I never really realized it until you just said it. Cause it's just kind of like how we operate as a family. Like it's everything I love. Thank you for sharing that story. Cause it's so beautiful. And that's, that's an incredible example of just that, you know what it addresses, Larry, it addresses the fact that, this is the DNA of, of leadership and parenting. It's something that, I, that I've that i created. And it's, it goes from, if you imagine the DNA strand, there's eight things on the DNA strand. And the top of the DNA strand, number one, has actually got to do with growth, growing your people, growing your kids, growing your business, right? And the bottom, it starts off with a relationship. And so when you go from a relationship, number eight, to number seven is trust. So the first thing that has to be in place is trust. Say what you uh, do what you say. Trust is that it is, it is a deep, deep, deep space for trust. The, the third thing, which now is number six, going up backwards, right, is um, is transparency. So when you have a relationship and trust, you can be transparent with one another. Transparency is calling each other out, challenging each other, speaking to about what it w what what this would look like when we're when we're in a sincere journey with one another. And it's easy to say, hey, Larry, can you give me feedback on this talk? And then you give me feed feedback and I'm wounded. Why? Because we don't have enough relationship. We don't have enough trust. Otherwise, I'd receive what you're telling me in a different way. And what's exciting about this is that those three things lead to something called accountability. And accountability is this mentoring, upskill, which we've spoken about. But also um, accountability is uh, recognizing that mood follows action. So what we have to have is action 
Otherwise, we're in a place where all we want to do is collect information and we never do anything with that. And so as soon as you can be a part of um, accountability, seeing action in any form of way, it adjusts your mood, which is what's happening in your home. You're adjusting the mood by taking actions. doesn't matter what those actions are. And the beautiful thing, as I alluded to earlier, the next four pieces are narrative, which leads to validation of culture. That leads to engagement, which in a corporate sense means retention. You have narrative story coming up, which validates the culture in your home. The culture re results in retention and recruitment. Retention, your kids want to stay there. Recruitment, your kids' friends want to come there. And that's what growth comes from so you're exact that you what you're describing is exactly what the dna of leadership looks like and it touches every single one of those boxes it, it's worth celebrating and you've created a culture which is what this is what's important culture when you have there's two cultures the aspirational and transformational aspirational cultures one day we'll be good bosses one day we'll be nice people one day we'll be good to our customers right? Transformational is you go home and you behave in a way that is meaningful and compelling to your own family because of what you've learned at work. But here's what's so exciting about culture. Culture is actually the standard operating procedure for your business. When a culture is in place, you don't need rules. The culture dictates what happens. It's beautiful. But if you don't recognize how to build culture, basically through accountability, upskill, and mentoring, which then tells the stories, and the stories validate your culture over and over again. That's the real win. And what you're doing is you're creating narratives by holding your kids accountable to do the posted exercise, to have dinner together, to help their brother, and you're celebrating that in some really powerful ways, which creates this engagement, which is going to ultimately grow them, and the culture is the rules. You don't need rules. You don't need a rule to say, put down your phone when the culture's in place. So that's definitely worth celebrating. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, well, thank you for sharing everything you did. Uh, this was, this was a really, really amazing experience for me personally, just, just hearing everything that you had to share. I took meticulous notes here in the background. I was, I was just typing away and, uh, I want to give the audience an opportunity to connect with you if they want to, but I, I want to, I want you to share what the best way is to do that. Also to, to go pick up your book as well. Thank you. Uh, what's the, what's the best way for that? Um, so uh, maybe you can drop the, the, the contacts in, in the, the show notes, probably the best contact um, is on my website, Stephen J Robertson.com. I've only used my middle initial J because Stephen Robertson wasn't available and neither was Steve Robertson. So Stephen J Robertson.com. Um, I'm on, I'm on most of the channels. Uh, I would love you to, if, if this has moved your heart in any way to read um, aliens among us, I joke that the next generation are aliens. That's why the world is green. Aliens are green. And when you see them as aliens, maybe your heart is stirred to engage in them in a different way. And then we recognize actually we're all becoming aliens because we're all turning green. Um, it's called aliens among us. If you, if you, if you do pick it up and read it, I, that would really touch my heart. And it's on Amazon. Of course. You know, what's so funny is when your team reached out to us, uh, I, I saw the email come through. And of course, every time I get a, an email from a publicist about a book, you know, they always put the book in bold. And I was like, what, what is this? Like, literally, I thought it was like, is this guy like a conspiracy theorist? Like, are there you're like literally? And then I looked into your stuff and I was like, oh, <laughs> Yes, let's have him on. And I'm so glad we did. So this was great, Stephen. Thank you, Thank Larry. You. What a joy to be with you. You bet. Same here. Gentlemen, you won't have to look far. Head on over to thedadedge.com forward slash Friday 148 for this show. Again, thedadedge.com forward slash Friday 148 for this show. You'll be able to connect with Stephen. We'll also have a link for his book in there as well. Uh, but this was an honor. And by the way, gentlemen, if you feel so compelled, uh, make sure you find, by the way, on Instagram, Stephen, what's what's the best spot for you? Um, what's my, my handle on Instagram? Yeah. Uh, Stephen underscore J underscore Robertson. All those contacts are on my website. And, and sincerely, any dad who thinks I can just breathe anything into their lives, I, I am a serial connector. For me, there's no greater passion than connecting. So please feel free if you feel like I could help anything. Or if you've got something of value to share with me, I'm like a sponge. I, so both ways. Thank you. Awesome. You, you got it. Well, the reason I ask is because, gentlemen, if you feel so compelled, if this podcast with Stephen moved you, touched you in any way, shape, or form, brought you value, just 
shoot him a DM, let him know you heard him on the dad edge, let him know that, uh, that you really appreciate his message. If he helped you today, I know he helped me tremendously. My, my brain is like just firing on all cylinders of like, Oh, what, what more things can we do for perseverance and communication and all this other stuff. And, and to be outliers is as far as, you know, parents go, but this was great, man. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, go out, live legendary. Take care.